All right. Hey there, everybody. Um, well, I'm actually struggling a bit today because uh, when I got here this morning, uh, I broke my glasses uh, in oh. the parking lot. So normally I'm able to kind of, uh, well, read and stuff. So I'm doing my best today. So still go through uh, material on uh, chapters 11 and 12. And well, I'll just do my best. But, uh, but yeah. That's all we have. Ha. <laughs> Ten, yeah, we did 10, now it's 11 and 12. That's correct. Yeah, we're taking them in sequential order. Um, oh, yeah, so chapter 11 is all about small towns. Um, and there's a lot of technical definitions of small towns that he goes through, uh, you know, seventh order this and, and Hamlet that and that type of thing. Basically, in a nutshell, like, you've all been driving out through small towns and maybe, like, you're running low on gas, right? And so you're like, well, I'll pull off over to this, this small town and just get some gas. And you may do that and you may drive through and you may see, like, maybe there's a church. Uh, and then maybe there's no gas station, right? And it's like, well, okay, I hope I'll last until the next one. That's kind of in a nutshell when he's ranking different small towns. It's based on kind of what they have going on, you know? Um, so for example, I have, I have friends who run a, a board gaming convention uh, in a small town called Siren, uh, which it's a small town, but it's big enough to have uh, a hardware store and a hotel, right? It has a number of these things that are kind of a bit higher order, still a small town, uh, but they have more going on, right? Grocery stores, cafes, kind of depends. Um, like I said, he goes through all these different specifics of what counts as different ranking of businesses and whatnot, and you know, I'm not gonna have you commit that stuff to memory or anything. Uh, but one of the main things uh, that our author is talking about when talking about these topics is how in general in small towns in Minnesota, uh, these businesses, as they go out of business, as small towns decline, uh, as populations continue to uh, move out of small towns, and this has been going on for 150 years or so, uh, as, the, as the populations move out, the, the hierarchy of the things that close follow the same kind of order, so you have your biggest things that kind of close up first, right? And you have a smaller that, that is still there uh, through time. Small town decline. Uh, this map here shows a bit of a hierarchy of, of small towns. Um, you know, a number of them, as you get further out from the cities, um, you know, you might be surprised that some smaller towns are, are a bit larger uh, because, well, they have a certain kind of uh, market area, right? So, like, let's say you have a business that is like a car rental business, right? Well, you wouldn't want to have that right next to another small town that has car rental because you'll just be competing against each other and you don't have enough people for that size of a market, right? So a lot of this chapter is talking about market areas uh, and that that's what's kind of still originally got the small towns going, uh, especially when, well, when our economy was agricultural based, right? And that's what our, the economy was uh, you know, worldwide for hundreds of years, uh, agricultural based and therefore land based. Um, thus, the whole system of, of conveying land and property ownership uh, to people uh, when when Minnesota was was first uh, created as a state and whatnot. Um, let's see. And I, I know that it's also confusing because sometimes. You'll see things that are defined as a city, uh, and it, it really depends on the population, right? Uh, if you have over 2,500 people, that's technically an urban area, right? An urban, we connect with cities. Uh, but very often, uh, even as these depopulate, they will keep their, their definition of as a city, even if the populations go below this. 
Uh, I, it's also confusing because the way property is divided up in the United States, well, I talked about this a few chapters ago, uh, you have an area that's six by, miles by six miles, and that's just declared a township, even though it's not technically a town that like has a mayor or a city council and stuff like that. That's just the technical, technical definition of uh, that area of land. Um, so let's in this chapter we have kind of covered before. So for example, um, you know, the first small towns uh, in Minnesota were along river routes because that's how everything was conveyed around. Uh, basically, when those had kind of uh, maximized their, their range and people had kind of settled in those areas and the switch to railroads happened and then everything was around railroads. And railroads in Minnesota as well as elsewhere were a huge money-making endeavor, uh, giant amounts of money made by the railroads, mostly because uh, the states gave them property for these railroads, because it was considered a public good to, to put in this transportation. Uh, but then the railroads, well, they could, dis they could, for example, decide where two tracks cross, right? And that, well, then that seems like a natural place to have an actual station where, where things and people are picked up uh, and dropped off, and so thus, how you plan your railway lines suddenly will explode the value of a place and it's a place that the railroad companies owned uh, and they, so they could make these plans and they could get the, the land for near nothing. Sometimes they would buy adjoining land even if they knew that among their plans was to have a city there uh, and then they would make quite a bit of money. Uh, looking at these maps here, incorporated places um, and I would say you could almost see the lines of the railroads uh, in these areas kind of uh, kind of almost fanning out from the central cities, right? Not all of them, this one here. Uh, this is a, related to our next chapter actually looking at mining. Uh, a number of these rail lines were put over places that had very productive ore deposits, uh, but they didn't know it at the time, but it became became, again, very valuable for, you know, oh, you're the railroad company that is going over the main ore that is, that is taconite or whatever else. Um, book talks about how, well, you know, again, if you go visit some of these uh, small towns, like I think one of the conversations we had before, people, uh, quite a few people said they'd been to Taylor's Falls, right? Go to a town like that, uh, they still have uh, a couple old train stations there, and they're, they're laid out very much like this. Um, and usually these towns had, had just a very kind of formulaic layout. Uh, you know, you'd have your, your, your rail line go through, and then you'd kind of have your main town. Um, oh, one kind of interesting thing the book points out, uh, churches were always put at the at the far corners. So if you're ever driving and you go through a small town, you might notice there's often a church when you enter and then a church when you leave. Do people remember uh, why churches were at the, the edges of these small towns? It was an awkward plot. So it was just a little bit weird to place it. Um, is there a reason the churches weren't placed more central in the cities? Um, any other guesses? Too much commercial space for uh, with, with, with competing with other companies. Right. How much money? Uh, how much tax money is your church going to bring into your city? Being in the center of your little business district, not much, right? Not much. Uh, honestly, a lot of cities and city planners they consider churches. Uh, not valuable use of, of real estate. Uh, and again, that's because they're looking at, well, how much tax revenue are those gonna bring in? Churches aren't taxed, right? Uh, and so they would stick them at the edges of the town, uh, kind of as, as a bit of an afterthought. Uh, not dissimilar to kind of what's going on today. Um, 
as I mentioned, small towns, they could still be incorporated, still defined as a town, uh, even if they're, they're depopulated, and a lot of our small towns are. Uh, as you can see there, percentage of incorporated places by population change per decade. Uh, in general decline, some ups and downs, but in general. <clears throat> Another chart from the book. Um, Oh, I think this is a repeat of the one I put up already. Uh, and you can see the populations of, of towns. The populations around this, these were kind of like the last of the small towns to kind of be in place. Uh, and they're often the first to be depopulated. Uh, I can see, well, the dots of, of about really, really, really small towns, right? We're talking really small towns. Um, so there are some places that uh, kind of go against those overall trends. Uh, small towns that are increasing in size. Uh, has anyone ever heard of the term exurb? Not until now. Not until now, exurb. Well, let's see. Let's talk about uh, development. Uh, so Twin Cities, right? Um, well, jobs and whatnot. So people were coming to the, to the central Twin Cities. Um, after automobiles became all the rage is kind of when the suburbs really took off nationwide as well as in Minnesota. Um, and that's especially the, the inner ring suburbs, inner ring suburbs. So like, Robbinsdale, Crystal, uh, the kind of closer suburbs. Um, further out suburbs uh, took a little bit longer, but it actually was when people moved out of the central cities and into those suburbs, sometimes they're called bedroom suburbs. Uh, well, then when they were living there, then the area that they could look for work uh, expanded out, right? And so now if they got a job, that was in the suburb that they're in, right? Often these are called bedroom suburbs because these early suburbs did not have a lot going on. They would have a gas station, uh, but people still did most of their shopping in the central cities and people basically just drove out and they had their neighborhood and they had their family and kids and stuff like that. Uh, but a lot of those suburbs didn't have a lot going on. It wasn't until much later uh, that a lot of those suburbs started putting in malls and things, uh, a much more kind of recent development. Well, at, like I was saying, if people, if you're living in one of those inner ring suburbs and hey, there's a job that's a little further out, uh, you know, like what's a further out suburb? Woodbury is a bit further out, but there's jobs there, right? Even uh, Burnsville and Bloomington, right? Um, well, slight tangent. Uh, uh, Joel Garreau, who is a urban theorist who, who popularized the term exurbs, he was looking at specifically suburbs that have gotten so big that they compete with the central city uh, for business and resources, which was uh, at the time kind of an unheard thing. How would a suburb ever compete with a downtown? Well, Mall of America, right? Way competes with downtown. Um, and actually, when he coined his term, uh, he looked at Bloomington and Burnsville as one of the main examples of an exurb of one of those, what had been a small town and what had been a suburb, had even been a bedroom uh, suburb, didn't have much going on, really changed around, really changed around. Uh, to the point that now a lot of people live in Burnsville or Bloomington, and then if you live there, well, your commute range, you could get a job that's even further out, right? So, for example, small towns that were near uh, Bloomington and Burnsville, they might have been dying and in decline, but they came back because all of a sudden they're commutable for people, for the many, many people who are working in, in those suburbs. Uh, so that's in general the small towns that have kind of revived to come back. They're ones that are within a, an easy commute range, uh, not just from the central cities, but also from our main suburbs. Uh, People have wondered, uh, you know, if that development was going to even go further out or whatnot. I would say not with the way gas prices are, not with the way gas prices are. 
you know, plus people just don't want to spend that much time driving, you know. Uh, I have friends who actually, they love to drive and drive and drive and drive. I'm not one of those people. It's like, I want to get to where I want to go and then be where, where I am. Uh, all right, so I've served suburbs, small towns. Uh, yeah, a lot of small town functions have been uh, replaced by, by strip malls. Um, these little maps here, as far as what they're showing, it's kind of interesting because when we talk about manufacturing in the US and in Minnesota, usually manufacturing was classically in the central cities, right? Because you need lots of people to work in a factory and to keep it going. Uh, but the central cities then through time, well, uh, manufacturing jobs, it's kind of a long story. They, uh, they went uh, first kind of to southern states, uh, and then they went south of the border into like Mexico, uh, and then later on to China, right? A lot of manufacturing jobs now are worldwide. Um, and so the central cities have really changed a lot of what they've done. So now if you're, if you're driving around like downtown St. Paul or Minneapolis, you might notice a lot of new developments going in that are like residential. Those are usually going in where there was industrial. There's been a big effort to try to, for example, see the riverfront, which used to be just useful for industry, right? It's like, let's, let's bring stuff in here, let's dump our garbage like into the river. Well, you guys remember some videos and stuff. Everything we used to just be dumped in the river. Um, well, there's been a big effort in Minnesota, especially other states as well to some extent, to say, hey, let's look at the river as an amenity. This is a nice thing that like, you could hang out by some trees and have, have a good view, maybe regenerate some of the wildlife. This could be something that people want to live near. And that's actually been pretty successful. And that's why, you know, even in our time of uh, our pandemic and a lot less people hanging out in downtowns than they used to, uh, the construction is still really booming. Uh, and I, I personally think uh, we'll get we'll get life back into our downtowns again. Downtowns were declared dead uh, like in the 90s for a while and, and for a while it was like, oh, it's just gonna be the suburbs and downtowns are, no one wants to hang out down there. Uh, but they came back, uh, so I think they'll come back again. Oh, but anyway, when I was talking about looking at these maps, if it's kind of confusing, <coughs> well, there is still manufacturing in uh, Minnesota. Uh, it's just kind of moved a bit and there's less, but manufacturing has moved more to small towns because they still have the capacity in space and a lot of them uh, places that were set up for manufacturing that might have went out of business in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, they're kind of coming back into business because they've been brought back into kind of like the range of, of, of where people can work and where you could easily get people uh, to commute from other suburbs as workers. And there's a number of different examples of that uh, in the book of, of buildings being, being uh, recycled, I guess is the term. Actually, yeah. All right, I'm gonna stop my video and then restart.